Hi folks, Dr. Rob Sivers. Uh, I'm the Carb Addiction Doc. And before we get into today's uh, video, I just want to say thank you so much to folks that throw us a few dollars at our Patreon account and especially at our PayPal account. The addresses are in the show notes below, but that keeps this channel free. You can help us by subscribing to this channel and by liking the videos or even leaving a comment. And if you see some of our videos popping up on your feed, click on it for a few seconds. Thanks so much. And now to today's video. Hi folks, Dr. Rob Sivers. We've been doing a series of videos on optimizing the carnivore diet. This is the last of those videos and it's going to be about two topics that are linked. First of all, I'm going to at the end of this talk about the optimal carnivore diet for the first year or two of your life. Um, looking at some of the other videos about how to be sure you're not swinging the pendulum over and making those corrections is not going to be necessarily in this video. The second part about this, we, in fact, I'm going to address this first, is what about specific health issues? So, for example, if you've had previous cardiovascular disease, you've got a stent, you've had a cabbage, you've got soot plaque, you've got an arrhythmia, is a carnivore diet safe for you? Or you've got kidney damage and your kidneys aren't working well, is a carnivore diet safe for you? And I would tell you that the worst thing you can do if you've got heart damage or um, kidney damage is a poorly formulated carnivore diet that is high in protein. Terrible thing to do. However, <laughs> the flip side is the healthiest diet, the healthiest anti-inflammatory diet for someone with heart damage, for cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or for somebody who has kidney damage or diabetes type 1, type 2, has serious illnesses. The healthiest, best diet to manage those diseases and to remove consequences from those diseases is a well-formulated carnivore diet. So let's go through the healthy, the strategies for a healthy, well-formulated diet, and let's talk about the important aspects. So on the kidney side, you don't want too much protein. And obviously a carnivore diet supposes that you're eating too much protein, but that's not true. And on a cardiac diet, you don't necessarily want excess cholesterol deposits, okay? I didn't say cholesterol causing heart damage, but excess cholesterol deposits. And you certainly don't want uric acid levels to go high because uric acid is an independent inflammatory trigger, okay? So what's a well-formulated uh, 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 carnivore diet? The first thing, and there's, there's three important uh, categories here. The first one is, to the extent possible, try to do all your cooking at your own home, where you are in charge not only of the ingredients, but also of the amount you plate. And as part of cooking at home, always be prepared and intentionally provide leftovers. Learning to eat sequentially, where you start with a very small amount and go back for more, rather than thinking, I need this massive amount. Because massive amounts are the enemy of all diseases, even when you're eating carnivore, because you're forcing your body to over-account for the amount you ate. You're staying in storage mode for too long, not getting into utilization mode, and you are running futile cycles. You're burning off excess energy, which may advance cardiovascular and certainly renal dysfunction. So eat a tiny amount, under-eat slightly, and go back for more rather than overeat and demand that your body handles the excess. Crucial and never discussed in anybody in a carnivore space. Oh, eat as much as you want to. False, false, false. Learn to eat sequentially. And some days you'll eat more, some days you'll eat less, but don't have a predetermined amount you eat. And the best way to regulate that is at home, especially if you're prepared for leftovers. Secondly, get into slowly, progressively, get into a hormonal cycle where you have a brief period of storage phase, insulin, glucagon, human growth hormone, thyroid hormone, rise, low glucagon, and then have a prolonged period of utilization uh, phase. Jason Fung made intermittent fasting popular. This is why. Going through a glucose utilization phase and then going through a fat utilization phase and the fat utilization phase being the healthiest for your heart and for your kidneys. So going through those three cycles of um, food storage, food utilization is crucial to replenishing and then rebuilding, repairing, and protecting your body. That cycling is crucial. That's the pattern of eating. Okay. And then the final state 
is the ingredients themselves. And at first, you always want to make sure that you are using fat as your primary fuel source. And at first, you want to eat more to overwhelm the system a little bit. But eventually, you need enough fat to provide for your energy needs, but not too much fat that you disrupt the system. So you start with high fat and you slowly reduce the amount of fat by ratio, but you're also eating a smaller amount of protein, even though the ratio goes from high fat and low protein ratio to a lower fat, higher protein by ratio, but a smaller quantity. Does that make sense? Okay. So at first you start with as much fat as you want to. Protein comes along for the ride, but the fat saturates you. Eventually, you lower the protein, to the, the fat to protein ratio, but you're eating a smaller amount less often. So you're still not overwhelming the system. Okay, and there's ways ways we can monitor that. But high fat, minimizing, never focusing on how much protein you eat. Even when you're eating higher protein, lower fat, you don't want to eat up to a certain amount of protein. It's just that automatically the ratio shift. However, you want to eat as little protein as you can. That is eating sequentially because you'll always eat enough. Don't let anybody ever contaminate you with you must eat more protein. Very, very seldom, occasionally, but very seldom do we need to do that. Okay? And I'd rather eat more often than more at a meal. Okay? But that's the macro side. And then bring in the micros. And the broader the range of macros, the different animal products you can eat, the broader the range, the better. Bringing in micronutrients, your eggs, your dairy, your liver, your small fish, your fish roe, very important as condiments or as meals by themselves. One of the things they do at a restaurant is you go in there, you're hungry. You may know exactly what you're going to eat, but they'll often put bread on the table or chips on the table or whatever it is, or they, you order an appetizer that arrives before your main meal. Well, the reality is we only need to eat a portion of one entree, ideally share it. However, you're hungry. So instead of having the bread or having the tortillas or having that drink, I tend to take one of these two guys with me. I take either a Keto and IQ or the little gel packs that can fit in a bag without, uh, a, or in my pocket. I'm a guy. Uh, my wife tends to take these in her purse. And when we arrive, I'll swallow one of these and chase it with some water or chase it with an electrolyte mix. It costs me nothing in the restaurant. Yes, there's cost to this. However, it protects me until my meal arrives. And then because we put our entrees in the middle of the table and we all share, I'm not ravenous and I'm not binge eating. So this is a very, very useful hack for those of you like me that are binge eaters, just to temper that and give you an early sense of satiety after you've eaten very little. Plus, you save a hell of a lot of money if you're ordering one entree for the table instead of every person ordering an entree. So just a little hack. This is how I use Keto and IQ. And that is the ideal carnivore diet. Eating mostly at home, eating sequentially, pattern of eating, and then broad range of high fat macronutrients with micronutrient foods as condiments with every meal. Drinking water for hydration and a bridge drink, this is coffee, a bridge drink with or without salt, with or without fat, but no other calorie source as a mind cleansing moment for your head. And then the one thing that I have underemphasized, but I'm going to emphasize critically in this, no matter who you are, if you have a pulse, you are capable of physical activity. And physical activity is crucial, both as a, a primary objective, as an intentional objective, as well as being top of your head and being ad hoc, being opportunistic. Not because I want you to be fit, not because uh, it helps you to lose weight or anything like that, but because what physical activity does is it triages the storage phase product you're eating toward your muscles, toward utilization by your tissues, rather than and away from storage by your liver and storage by your fat cells. You want that ebb and flow where you store during storage phase and you utilize during utilization phase. And part of utilization is creating a need. And the need is both intellectual brain power as well as physical activity. So doing things that trigger brain function, doing things that trigger physical activity instead of just sitting there watching TV. So take this podcast on a walk with you. 
So you're stimulating your brain and stimulating your body. And when you come back, you feel pretty good about yourself because you've learned and you've done. I am the carb addiction doc. If I've made you think, I've done my job.